his feet. Oh, close race. But Lingenfelder pulls ahead right at the finish line, 775 to a losing 787. How did John Lingenfelter become what car and driver called the most prolific purveyor of horsepower they'd ever seen? We think it began when he was just a youngster. My dad actually got John started in this, and he was a very good mechanic, and I think John learned a lot. Dad had bought John an ADCO midget. And when we first started racing go-karts though, I think John had a natural ability. Dad said the first race, I remember Dad telling John, now just take it easy, get the feel of it. I mean, he went in and won that race. It seems as though everything the Lingenfelters did as a family turned into a competition. The competitiveness was always there. Monopoly games, um, card games, just everyday things that went on at home. It was fun. It wasn't mean competitive. It was fun, but, and you always had to make, if it got too easy, you had to put another challenge to it. John couldn't lose. Uh, he had to find out, and he analyzed every game, but he had to find out exactly what it was that made him lose. So he'd try it again and try it again, and he'd watch what you'd do, and he'd study what you'd do. While in high school, John met his first wife and future mother of his two daughters, Carrie and Kelly. I was a senior and he was a junior, and we just hit it off right away, and we started dating. And in college, he acquired a degree from Penn State University. Then we got married, and then he uh, worked at Harvester, International Harvester in Fort Wayne. He worked there, oh, probably 10 years, uh, good job, good money, you know, good insurance. He learned a lot there, too, from, from the other engineers, you know, and... Uh, it just seems like he just became a little disinterested in that type of work and he was dabbling in racing and motors and reading up on things like that. And then I think that's when it really, really busted wide open, when he, was, he, had, he knew what he wanted to do. In 1972, John won his first NHRA National. And by 1974, John Lingenfelter decided to leave International Harvester and begin racing full-time. And as you can imagine, racing full-time keeps you away from home more than 40 hours a week. When he was home, he, he loved his girls. He always told them that he loved them, always. And then when he was gone, you know, he would always call, two, three times a day. It was just an unconditional love you knew was there. And even when he hugged you or kissed you or looked at you, it, it was so sincere, you just knew it was heartfelt, and it's all it took, you know, a wink of his eye or a kiss in the air, and you just knew it. You were loved unbelievably, even though he didn't have all the time he wished. Yeah, he just had this thing about it. even, and I think he touched strangers as well, like, oh, I met your father once, and, you know, he had, had this impact, and even though he was this really quiet man, and, but I think that, that warmth came out always. Even growing up, if, if you needed, you know, if it was picture day and mom didn't have any money, you know, he would reach in and give you his last, pull out his last yeah. 20 or, you know, if you needed new uh, baseball cleats or softball cleats, you know, or something, he would make sure you got what you needed. John's racing career earned him 13 NHRA titles, but the whole time he was racing, he was gaining knowledge in Chevy small block engines knowledge he would soon put to use on the Chevrolet Corvette. We had maybe 16 customers in the racing field. We started doing the street cars and uh, the mail order engines were under the Lingenfelder racing to begin with. And we changed the name because we were trying to drift away from the racing other than John himself racing. I think the, the best thing is, is with John was he was a, a very, very smart person. He would get a vision and something, think about it, and he didn't write a lot of stuff down on paper. He would keep a lot of it in his head. But he, once he had that vision in his mind, his sights were set. That's what he was going to do. And in 1984, when we started doing the mail order engines, it bloomed. It took off bigger, I think, than what he anticipated that it would take off. And it was really a great feeling. When we started doing the injected cars, I had an 84 Corvette. John and I went out and beat on it for about a half a day. And he was impressed with the car's chassis and the way it left. So then we started in the 85 package, and that's where all the Corvette performance at this shop, that was created at that time with the 85 cars. John had started building 383 engines, 406s, uh, 461s. And then fuel injection, and the, the developments with fuel injection, you know, when he started the street work with the Corvettes, 
um, Lingenfeld has really led the way in EFI aftermarket adaptations. As business grew, John's reputation became twofold in that his customized cars could also be everyday drivers. That was always something he, he loved was you know horsepower but with no compromises. He would never let us take the air conditioning off of a car. He always wanted to be able to make a thousand horsepower but then putts along the highway and have the air conditioning on and go stop at a restaurant, eat and get out and start the car up and keep driving. And that's one thing you notice with all the Lingenfelter cars is that the car not only performs you know, to an outstanding degree, but it's got amazing drivability. Oh, well, it had to be as smooth as could be. He wanted you to be able to get in as a customer and not know that it had been modified until you leaned on it. You could go 200 miles an hour and then drive it and get 28 miles a gallon. That's the impressive part, and do it every day. Now, that's one of the keys to the, to the company. John picked the best components. We'd never take anything less than what we built in the race cars. That's what goes in our engines. In 1997, Lingenfelter Performance Engineering also found some new opportunities with the introduction of the all-new C5 Corvette. I'd say one of the, the key uh, turning points for us was in the development of the twin turbo packages in the late 1990s. And that really helped us uh, move into a new technology, so to speak, a new uh, customer base, and really kept us on top of the market. Since 1999, when we started on the turbo cars, we've done well over 200 turbo cars. Uh, we've done several hundred of the supercharged C5s also. John knew that if he was going to continue racing himself, his business would only be as strong as the people he hired and trained to run it. And after he crashed at Pomona, the team at LPE was ready to see that the door stayed open. When... Uh when I uh, got the phone call that Sunday night that John had his accident, I knew, you know, because this is a, a hands-on business and it was, you know, it was all about John and his knowledge and, you know, to know, you know, my main focus, my main goal that Monday morning was to come in and was to keep the business up and running the best to my ability, you know, and, and we had a great, great, you know, crew of people here that were always like, you know, basically family, you know, it was just a really close knit of people that you know, we were going to keep everything running strong until John could get back on his feet and get back here. And you know, and everybody, everybody here had a focus. We would have meetings, and it was a vision that we knew that you know these doors were going to stay open and we were going to keep things going. You know, until John could get back here and and you know to take back over. Due to complications from the surgery needed after the crash, John Lingenfelter slipped into a coma and then died on Christmas Day of 2003. But if you ever visit LPE, you can still see and feel John's drive and determination. John had been proud to be here today. He's the one that set it up and we were trying to carry it on. And I think today we're even more refined. Our equipment's at a higher tech level. Uh, the people that we have right now, we have more people involved. And all of them are trained very highly. The uh, product Today, I'm sure, is better than it was 25 years ago. I think John will be proud for uh, uh, the job that we've done in carrying on his name and keeping this thing going through these, uh, these years since his passing. John would definitely be proud of what we've accomplished so far. Because of the extra horsepower and, and the, we're, we're now at street cars at over 1,000 horsepower. John would be very happy you know, with what's happened with his company and uh, you know, he always basically you know wanted the company to go on you know when he wasn't here when he was off racing on weekends you know he'd be gone quite a bit and uh, you know he put the right people in here to make sure things would keep moving when he wasn't around and it you know for what happened it worked out really well for the company to this day I still use uh, what John has taught me to you know to treat people right to you know customer service was always number one in his book and at Lingenfelder's today we still carry on John's tradition in, in just about every atmosphere of the business. Life in the fast lane. John, we love you.